Good morning, Google. How are you doing? It was very underwhelming. Let's try that again. Good morning, Google. How are you doing? All right, fabulous in the front row. I love it. I am Lydia Finette. I'm here in two capacities today. I am the lead charity auctioneer for Christie's Auction House, but I've also written a book called The Most Powerful Woman in the Room is You. So I'm going to spend the next half hour with you giving you tricks of the trade, things that I've learned after 16 years of being on stage, 70 to 100 nights a year, taking auctions to benefit nonprofits. So I thought, because how many of you have been to an auction before in this room? Don't ever raise your hand at an auction, ladies and gentlemen, unless you plan to bid. It's a <laughs> cautionary tale. I will not warn you again. I thought that the a fun thing for us to do would be to have a quick mock auction so that everybody gets a sense of things that can be done on stage to sort of liven up what can sometimes be a pretty mundane thing at a charity auction. So imagine we're all at a party. You've come here with your friends. You're seated after a long cocktail hour. There have been a number of speeches. And then all of a sudden, up pops a very tall woman with brown hair. That's me. And she says to the audience, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are going to have a fantastic live auction now to benefit the charity. Now, many of you will not have even known that this was taking place. So the most important thing for me to do is get your attention as soon as I get on stage, which is exactly what I did with the gavel. So right after I do that and I get your attention, I move very quickly into our first lot. Now, mind you, this is going to be our first and only lot this evening. So lot number one. Ben Stiller, ladies and gentlemen. Lot number one is a backstage and after party at SNL with Ben Stiller. Again, I work for Christie's. I don't sell Picasso's, ladies and gentlemen. This is the kind of thing that I sell. One person will join Ben Stiller as a, his personal guest for a live taping of Saturday Night Live. You're going to go to the green room. You're going to see the studio. Ben Stiller will show you around. The most important thing to remember is these are not things that you can do on your own. This is truly a priceless experience. And in addition to this, you will go with Ben to an after party. So this would be a perfect example of something that I would sell at a charity auction. There is no value, literally no value whatsoever. The tickets for SNL are free. You can go. And then obviously going to an after party, unless you plan to go to the bar, is also going to be free as well. So really it is up to the audience to decide how much this is going to go for. So at Christie's, whenever we're assessing artwork, one of the first things that we talk about is who is going to buy this? Or what is the provenance? Where did this come from? Who is our buyer? So in this case, Calhoun is a school in New York City. It's a private school. All of the money that we're raising this evening is going towards a scholarship. So naturally, the parents, who have now had many cocktails, are also excited to give back to the school. So keep that in mind when I ask you this first question. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start the auction, but I'd like to see what you guys can do. Can anyone in this room start me off with a number? Any number you want. Remember that I work for Christie's. We did sell a Da Vinci for $400 million last year, so keep the number high. And that's how we would kind of start it out to liven up the crowd. So anyone in the room, we're going to have a mock auction right now. You guys decide where this ends. I know where it ended because I was on stage that night, and you will see where it ended. But I want to see how close you guys get to where we actually ended up. So anyone in the room, start me off with a number. $1,000. Who are, I'm sorry, who said that? Out of the, out of the black abyss. Ma'am, what is your name? You know, it's funny because I noticed you when you first walk out, walked in and I thought to myself, that is the kind of woman who will be my first bidder in an auction, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Something with a necklace, I don't know what it was. So we're at $1,000 here, I'll take $2,000 next. Do I have $2,000 in the room? $2,000. $2,000 has been on my left. Thank you for entering the auction, ma'am. At $2,000 on my left, I'll take a bit of $3,000. Do you guys know how an auction works, right? Oh, here, welcome to the auction, sir, for $3,000 in the back row. At $3,000 here, I'll take a bit of $4,000 next. Remember, we're bidding towards a real number here. $4,000. Who said that? Okay, up in the steps, ladies and gentlemen. All the way enters last at $4,000 in the back of the room. Do I have $5,000 next? Excuse me, hold on one second, because I have a new friend on my right who just yelled out the number $10,000. <laughs> Welcome to the auction, sir, and be sure to find me afterwards. You're coming to all my auctions moving forward at $10,000 here. We are $10,000 on my right. I'll take a bit of $12,000 next. Do I have $12,000? It's Ben Stiller. SNL, has anyone been to SNL? $12,000 is bid. At $12,000 in the back of the room, I come back to you, sir, for 14. You said 10. It's so close. 
money grows on trees. This is something that I've been messaging to everyone in my life, <laughs> except my children, who I want to have better values than that, ladies and gentlemen. All right, we're at $12,000 in the back. I would take 14 from you, sir. He is out. We're at $12,000, but we're thinking of little Timmy and Susie and their beloved school, ladies and gentlemen. $14,000 is bid. At $14,000, the lady in red. My book cover is pink and red, so I am already a fan. At $14,000 here, I'll take a bit of or $16,000 next. We're at $14,000. $20,000. Who just bid that? $20,000 in the back of the room. This is a room of high rollers. They are clearly overpaying you all. I love it here at Google. <laughs> at $20,000, like free food overpayment. This place is fantastic. At $20,000 in the back of the room. But how high do we go? This is one person, ladies and gentlemen. Ben Stiller, after party ticket. $20,000 in the back of the room. $30,000 is bid on my left. I like the way you guys roll. We're at $30,000 here. Any advance over $30,000? Going once. $50,000. Jeez. <laughs> and now we're building a new school, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Goodbye, Calhoun of the past. Hello, Calhoun of the future at $50,000. But of course, we're in Manhattan, so that would build like a small bathroom. We're at $50,000 <laughs> in the front of the room. Any advance? Over $50,000. Someone's listening to a video. I'm clearly not entertaining enough, ma'am. I will come back to you in a bit and try a, a, dance, a dance routine for you in the next. We're at $50,000 in the front row. Last chance. Going once. $80,000. So tomorrow, when we finish this auction, ladies and gentlemen, we are at $80,000 in the back. Say 100, it's for the school, why not? $100,000 has been in the front row, and I will end it there because I don't want you all to be broke by the end of this mock auction. We are at $100,000 in the front row. Fantastic bidding to all. Congratulations, ma'am, for your school for $100,000 sold to you. It was definitely not enough applause for one person going to SNL, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so how close, how many of you think that she was close at $100,000? You guys have no answer. Nobody here at Google speaks. OK, we just type. I'll remember that. All right. I think it's too high. It's too You're right. $27,000. So let me tell you the most important thing that I have learned about selling, ladies and gentlemen. Don't ever cap yourself. Don't ever cap your product. People's perception of what you are worth is sometimes so much higher than what you think it is. When I first started taking auctions, anytime I would get on stage, in the manual, alongside lot number one, it would have a number for what someone thought something would go for. And interestingly, every single time, the lot would end up right around that number. A couple of years in, I said to someone, why don't we take out the number and just see what happens? They were like, no, it'll go too low. Nobody would, ever, nobody would ever think it would go that high. Well, let's just try. And so the first time we did it, anything that did not go close to the number that I thought it was going to, I messaged out what the retail value it was. And I had to do that once out of a 10-lot auction. Nine times out of those 10 times, people thought that something was more expensive than it was. And I use this as a, one of the first life lessons that I talk about when I talk about what I have learned on stage as an auctioneer. Don't ever cap yourself. Remember that anytime you go into any sales pitch, anytime you go into any type of negotiation, you have a number in your mind and so does the person across from you. And they're probably thinking, oh God, that person's too expensive. You know what, they're probably right, but you know what? You also don't have to say that out loud. So make sure that what you do is set expectations for what you want, but allow somebody else to come up with what they want first. Because a lot of times, you're going to get a lot more than you thought. For instance, even when I started today, and a lot of times when I start on stage, I start at $1,000. Because it's a nice round number. It feels good. And if I haven't even asked the audience for it, it's typically where we end up. But if I go to the audience and ask, and then I throw in the line about working at Christie's and give me a good number, I watch in their face as they sort of, mm, what is she going to say if I go too low? And it ends up being higher than what I would have originally asked for. So that is the first lesson of my mock auction. And now I will move on to what I call my top five selling tips. And we will move quickly through these. We will have a fantastic Q&A at the end. You will ask lots of robust questions. And you will all leave feeling inspired. See, I've messaged what I want from you. So there you go. <laughs> all right. 
Selling tip number one, since we're on the theme of Ben Stiller, ladies and gentlemen, that's me selling Ben. <laughs> there is a height difference, as I'm sure you can tell in this picture. Um, I was also wearing about nine inch heels. So here we go. The strike method. What did I do when I first came out here? You guys were all here. Somebody use your voice. I love the person who just went like this. <laughs> You're right. The first thing I do every single time I get on stage is the same thing. I walk on stage and I say, Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lydia Finette. I'm here from Christie's Auction House. I am delighted to spend this evening with you. In that five seconds, I have not only gotten the attention of everyone here, because if I was in a, loud, if I was in a crowded auction room, I would have slammed it down like crazy, because usually these auction rooms that I go into are filled with 500 plus people. So slamming that gavel down stops them from drinking that glass of wine, it stops them from talking to a friend, and it focuses them back on me. And in that moment, I spend that time looking around the room. Do I know anyone here? Okay, that's my first thing. If, I, if I'm looking around, do people look tired? Do they look like they're paying attention? Is this a crowd that looks friendly? Or are they kind of looking at me like, oh god, this is going to be a long auction, get off stage? How much energy do I need to bring to the room? Like right now, some of you look a little tired. I'm sure it's around lunchtime. You are probably a little tired, which is why I'm giving you extra energy, because I need that from you, and I need you to match it. So I'm trying really hard. It'd be great if you could help me out. <laughs> um, I also throw in jokes along the way, because it also snaps you back to attention. People love a good joke. So the strike method for me is something that I use in business as well. Anytime I go into a meeting, much like when I go on stage, I make sure that I have my first line completely embedded in my head. I will never get on stage with nerves because the minute I get on stage, I know exactly what I'm going to say. And that helps me feel like I'm in charge of the room. It helps me feel powerful. And even sometimes when, for instance, I get on stage at Madison Square Garden in front of 6,000 people with Bruce Springsteen waiting in the wings, I think to myself, I could be nervous, but I know what I'm going to say. So every time I go into a sale at work, anytime I'm going into a pitch, any type, of, any type of negotiation, I always remember to take a pause and have my first line completely embedded in my head. Because that means I'm coming from a point of strength. And I feel like I can communicate effectively because my voice is not wavering. The person across from me is getting the message. And they also feel like I know what I'm talking about. I'm sure we've all been in the meeting when the nervous presenter gets up and their face goes red and they start shaking and they bumble through the first couple of words. It's as uncomfortable being in your shoes at that point because you're like, oh God, please just spit it out. This is so painful to watch, please spit it out. So I always say with a strike method, same thing. Find whatever it is that calms your nerves. Make sure you have that opening line lined up and come from a point of strength. And anytime you forget about it, think of that gavel. It's the same thing. Take a pause, don't bring a gavel, you will probably get arrested. It's like you cannot get away with a gavel unless you're an auctioneer in a meeting, you guys. But do do something that feels authentic to you and bring that into your meeting so you feel like you're coming from a point of strength. My next selling tip, sell as yourself. I became a charity auctioneer for Christie's when I was 24 years old. Everyone I worked with at that point who was an auctioneer for the most part was at least 20 years older than me and 90% of them were male. And so when I trained to be an auctioneer, you try out kind of like Survivor, you go into a classroom, I teach it now, which is so fun, you walk into a classroom of 20 people, and essentially you're kind of thrown up, and they're like, tell, tell us a story, or you know, just try to sell something. And you watch people do what they do. And there are people who are naturally good at it, there are people that you can train into it. Sometimes it's a combination of both. So in my class, I was in a class, and it was basically me, and a bunch of guys, many of whom were already art auctioneers. And that was the only type of auctioneering I had ever seen. So when I went up for my turn, I did exactly what I had seen our 70-year-old amazing auctioneer do when he was selling Picassos. I sold the Ben Stiller lot the way that he sold Picassos, which is very different, ladies and gentlemen. It's very different than the style I have now. It's very different than the style you bring to a crowded cocktail room of people who've been drinking all night. Um, you, don't want to sell, you don't want to sell a puppy at 11 p.m. in the same way that you might sell a Picasso at 8 o'clock in a well-lit sale room. And so the first five years after I passed the class, I had taken so many auctions because I was so young and I had nothing else to do. I just moved to New York. I'm sure if any of you have ever moved to New York without knowing anyone, you know what it's like to just sort of be sitting in your apartment and wishing you were back in college. And that's very much how I felt at that point. And they would say, well, Lydia, do you want to go 
you know, to Kansas City. I'm like, yes, Kansas City sounds amazing. January in Kansas City. Who doesn't want to be in Kansas City in January? <laughs> Turns out I did not want to be in, <laughs> in Kansas City in January. But the point in being there and doing that, which I, I was at working on this style constantly. And so time after time, I would get off stage, and it was kind of crushing. Like, I feel like we're having a good time. Will someone just nod and pretend that that's true? Great, OK, thank you. Thank you to the five of you who are nodding and not sleeping. Thank you very much for that. And those of you who are not on your phones also. Um, but I would go into those auctions, and it just felt like nobody was paying attention. They were drinking. They were all talking to each other. I would not even really slam down my gavel. It was just kind of like I got up there, and I sold. And then I would leave feeling deflated and also just like I wasn't really that good at what I was doing. But I didn't really have anything else to do, so I just kept going back to it. And one night, I went to take an auction. It's a cold night in January, freezing outside. I'd been sick the whole day, like flu sick, like really, really ill. And I called all of the other auctioneers. This was so long ago, it was like a flip phone. So I called all the other, you guys are like, what's a flip phone? But they did exist, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. And no one could take the auction. So I ended up crawling to the, the Central Park Boathouse where the auction was taking place. And I sat in the chair by the podium. And the adrenaline surge that you get any time that you're about to get on stage came, but I still felt so badly that it barely came. And all of a sudden, I was on stage, and I felt just like a normal me, as opposed to this British auctioneer with a British accent that I also affected, which I think was really unusual, because I would be talking, and then I would switch into a British accent. And sitting directly in front of me, right before I started the first lot, was a woman who had been seated next to me when a boyfriend broke up with me at lunch years before. And I had cried through the whole lunch, even though I was in charge of it. And she had been so kind. And she really, I think, at first was overwhelmed because I was crying so hard. <laughs> but then she sort of like passed me chocolates and napkins and like a tablecloth because the tears were coming so quickly. <laughs> she was seated in the front row. And the first lot was cocktails and a tour of her art collection. And so instead of saying what I would have said if I hadn't been sick all day and felt like I was you know, playing auctioneer was, you know, ladies and gentlemen, cocktails at Jennifer's house and you know, a tour of her art collection. It'll be so lovely. And I said, ladies and gentlemen, lot number one is cocktails and a tour of a fabulous art collection. And there is no doubt you're going to have a wonderful time. But more importantly, Jennifer sat next to me at a, at a lunch when I was dumped horribly, can you imagine? And she's basically Oprah. So if, you're, if you are seeing a therapist right now, just cancel your sessions and buy this lot, because it will be much cheaper. She'll solve all of your problems in one day. And all of a sudden, I heard a couple of laughs. And all of a sudden, people were actually looking at me, and they weren't talking to each other. And so the next lot came up. And it was like the first time that I sort of thought to myself, that's what they meant when they said, sell is yourself, like sell authentically. Why am I pretending that I'm somebody that I'm not? I'm, at this point, I was sort of in my late 20s. And so it was something about Mexico. And I talked about how I'd gone to senior frogs in college and how there was something about a girls gone wild waiver that I very intelligently did not sign at the last minute. <laughs> but unfortunately, this wasn't going to be your experience because you were going to be staying in a luxury villa. And a man literally turned his chair around. And I remember thinking, OK, now I've got it. Now I get this. Sell as myself. Sell with my personality. Use a sense of humor. Make this interesting and fun. This isn't a Picasso. I'm selling something that nobody really wants. But how do I get <laughs> I'm selling something that everybody wants, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> always. But my point is that I'm selling for charity. It doesn't have to be me selling as an art auctioneer. So make it lively. Make it fun. And I bring that even into the way that I sell for Christie's now. I run all of the partnerships for Christie's globally. And when I go into meetings, I don't walk in there and pretend that I'm some hard-charging salesperson. I get to know the person across the table. I spend a little time trying to find common themes. And then I start the sales pitch once I understand what they want out of the entire sales pitch. And so that brings me to my next point. One of the things that I see in selling the biggest mistake I see in selling, especially in this day and age, is the elevator pitch. An elevator pitch only works when someone is trying to check a box. If you are in a sales call or a sales meeting, spend a couple of minutes getting to know the person across the table or on the other line. And I don't mean the false, like, how are you doing? How is your day? I mean, ask them what they want before you tell them what you have. Your first question to someone should not be, let me tell you what I've got to sell you. It should be, I'd love to hear a little bit about your business. What are you guys doing? What's new and interesting to you? I love that you're nodding so much, sir. 
I feel like you are also going to be at all of my auctions moving forward, a man who says yes to everything. It's fantastic. Um, but I do mean that every, every time I go in and just start charging into what we have that Christie's can offer, I watch people's eyes glaze, glaze over because I'm speaking a language that they don't understand. I need to speak to them in their language. Why do you think I threw out the first lot to you guys? Because I needed to understand where your head was and what you felt comfortable with. If I came out here and I said, the Calhoun thing, we're gonna start that at $10,000, everybody here would have been like, oh my God. But because someone in the audience started it with her beautiful necklace at $1,000, it felt comfortable for everyone. And that's what sales is about. It's about listening and it's about being a two-way conversation. And once you have that information, that's when you weave your sales pitch back into the pitch at large. So I always tell a story about going to do a sales pitch once. We had this amazing collection of Monet's that we wanted to send to China. And I walked into a bank that I'd worked with on a number of art projects in, the, in earlier years. And I said to the woman exactly what I said to you. She's the new chief marketing officer. They had a new CEO. I said, so tell me a little bit about what's going on at your bank. She goes, well, I'll tell you one thing. Our CEO is not into art. And I was like, well, that's going to be a problem because that's what I've got to sell, right? Actually, no. Christie's has a lot to sell. And one of the things we were selling that season was a collection of baseball memorabilia. Because the next thing she said to me was, the only thing he's interested in is sports. So imagine if I had walked into that meeting and I said, let me tell you about this Monet we're going to sell. We're going to send it to Asia. And I spent 20 minutes telling her about this, all the while she's thinking to herself, my CEO hates art. Those things don't align. So always listen first. So now you've listened. You think you've just nailed the sales pitch. What happens next? Rejection. It's like exercise, ladies and gentlemen. You have to do it, and the more you do it, the better you get. Doesn't always feel good, don't always want to do it, but it is like exercise. And the more times you get rejected, the better you will be at being rejected. I feel like this is something that we all do to ourselves. We try to protect our children from exercise. There have been so many articles in the New York Times written about snowplow parents and helicopter parenting. And I've worked with enough people over the course of my career to tell you that it is true. People fear rejection, and then they don't ask for things, and they end up getting nothing. I feel like I am primed for rejection because I stand on stage and there's always someone rejecting me. There's always an underbidder who comes back to me and says no. Right? So every night, if I'm selling five lots, I'm going to get rejected five times. Because five times, someone is going to tell me no. And typically what I say to them is, well, sir, I'm sorry you weren't coming in at $20,000, but now we know you have $20,000 to spend on a different, a, a different lot tonight. And that's how I deal with my underbidder. Rejection in any, in any shape of your life, and I talk about this a lot in the book, starts at a very early age. Many of us went through it. I played on, a high, or excuse me, I played on three teams in middle school, volleyball, basketball, and track that never won a game in four years. <laughs> I am not exaggerating, four years. And we thought we were gonna win every single time. Like, be clear. In our basketball team, we had six players and we would lose 52 to six. And that was even with the other team not raising their hands, but we didn't have offense and we didn't have defense and we didn't really know what we were doing. So it was just a total joke the whole time. Um, what it taught me and what my parents were incredibly good at teaching me is every single time you go back in and you give it your all. After every game sitting front row, and how painful would that be to watch your child well, for four years, watch every game lose? <laughs> front row, my parents would say to me, you know what? I think next time's gonna be the time. And I'd be like, I think you're right. <laughs> I talked to a lady at a call center at one of these sort of town hall meetings, and she said to me, you know what? I worked at a call center, and I was rejected over 10,000 times. She's like, I like to think that I'm bulletproof. And I think about that all the time. Rejection doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good for anyone, but the more you ask for things, the more you're going to get. I say to my team, come into my office and ask me for something you know you're not going to get. And hear me say no and realize it's not that bad. It's even easier now with email. All you have to do is press the button. And if you don't want to do it, get your friend to do it. But it's OK to hear the word no. Take the emotion out of it. It is not emotional. It is business. And rejection is going to come in every form of your life. Get used to it, celebrate it, make a joke of it, and move on. All right. Last key selling technique. Roadmap your life and follow through. Anything that you want to do in life, whether it be selling one product, selling yourself, you need to have a roadmap and you want to stick to it. I make roadmaps every single week. I have three small children. Just getting through the week feels like I'm navigating through a maze. So having a roadmap with every single thing coming down the pike 
written down is incredibly helpful to me. But I also have a roadmap for my life. It's written in pencil and paper. Sorry for all of you with computers. But it's true. It's written with pencils so I can change it as I go along. And every single thing that I want to accomplish in my life is written on that roadmap. And when I hit it, I check it off. And I also take screenshots and send it to my best friend. Because the most important thing about a roadmap is accountability. And if your best friend's constantly asking, Lydia, when are you going to write a book? And you haven't done it. Passing. You get sick of your best friend. But then you also get sick of hearing yourself do it. I'm going to get around to it. I'm going to get around to it. But you have to know where you're heading in life to be able to sell and to be able to sell yourself. Because if you don't know where you're heading, you can't do the most important thing that comes in selling anything in life. And that is get support around you. You need to surround yourself with people who support you. You need to surround yourself with people who see your vision. And you need to bring people along the way. Because those of us who are left behind, I'm not that person, so I won't say those of us. The people who are left behind are eager and desperate for somebody to show them how to get there. And if, you've, if you have figured out your roadmap and you are heading in the right direction, bring other people with you. I saw it all over. Like, that's what a Googler would do. So you guys already know this. It's part of your corporate culture. But I say to everyone, even with the book, like, buy the book, but then give it to somebody else. Give it to somebody who needs this book, who isn't inspired and isn't motivated and hasn't created their roadmap, because they can't see clearly in front of them what they want. It's the most important thing that you can do in selling, both in business but also in life. And finally, this is a bonus, ladies and gentlemen. This is the six. It's not a selling technique. It's just something that I say to my team all the time. And you probably have heard this before, but I do love this phrase. Be the CEO of your own company. It doesn't matter if you're an assistant. It doesn't matter if you're CEO. Be proud of what you do. And if you are not in a job that you love, but you need a paycheck, stay in that job and find something else that fulfills you and do it at the same time. We don't live in a world that's defined by borders anymore. You can have a side hustle and bring it into your full-time job and let that be the passion that keeps you going in day after day for a job that's giving you your paycheck. And maybe it becomes so big that you eventually leave. I think that's the, the whole startup mentality. But I've been in a company for 20 years. I've worked at this. I know you guys are dying inside. Are any of you even 20 years old? I don't know. <laughs> Two of you, OK. Um, you know, I, honestly, I've been in a company for 20 years. And 10 years ago, I started the department that I now run for the company. And I think if I'd left that company and done something completely different, my experience might have been completely different. But it has been an amazing thing to be in a company that has allowed me to grow a business within a business and also be a charity auctioneer on the side. So be the CEO of your own company, design your own plan, and create the life that you want to live. So thank you all so much for coming. I think I'm out of time. It's exactly 12.30. There will be a Q&A after this if you guys want to leave. I fully understand that, too. We haven't locked the doors. But I would love for you to stay, and I'd love to hear what you have to think. So thank you all very much. Oh. All right. You have to start and end with a gavel, ladies and gentlemen. It makes it more impactful. So um, as Lydia mentioned, we do have uh, Q&A coming up. I have a couple of questions about the book. Hi, I'm Rena Jana. I lead product and business inclusion strategy here at Google. And we also have two mics. So um, please queue up and um, get those questions ready. We also have a Dory. So we have some questions from Googlers around the country and around Great. the world coming for you. Fantastic. Um, first of all, have you ever seen slides in a suit matched in this <laughs> at this level of perfection, amazing. My next Google talk will be on branding and marketing, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. My hot pink Sharpies that I'll be using to sign my hot pink book are going to be there. So. Totally amazing. Um, first of all, just a quick question about the book. Um, it doesn't just have your tips in it. Mm -hmm. There are tips from women at the top of their game in a variety of industries from a real diversity of cultures, you know, from Mina Garcia, who's the editor-in-chief of Elle, to Sarah Kate Ellis, who's the CEO of GLAAD, Deborah Roberts, ABC um, journalist, from a variety of um, backgrounds. So why was that so important to you, to have this spectrum of communities represented? Well, when we first started talking about including case studies in the book, I started to think about one thing that my editor had said to me very early on, which was, you're writing this book. You work for Christie's, but you're writing this book for every, everyone. It's not just for women. It's not just for men. It's really for everyone who is looking for this kind of, 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 excuse me, of advice. 
And the case studies for me were an opportunity to showcase a variety of different people cross industry, but also, you know, it's amazing to see what Martha Stewart has done. She's at the top of her industry. Everyone knows exactly who she is. But it's also amazing to see a small business owner who's built something on her own and is killing it in her industry. And success looks different for everyone. So I wanted, I wanted people to open the book and say, that's someone that I could see myself being. Mm -hmm. Because I think we hear this all the time now, that what we're looking for in life are role models. People need people that they look up to who are doing things that are interesting and dynamic that they could eventually do. And so by giving them a breadth of women cross industry at different levels of success, but powerful in their own right. I hope to do that. Yeah, super inspiring. Um, the roadmap discussion was really interesting. I think a lot of us are working on product and um, build roadmaps and you know, are always thinking of launch plans, et cetera. Like it was really rung true um, when reading it. But you also are amazing at pivoting. And that, that did come up as a theme as well. So how do you balance that in terms of sticking to that roadmap your launch schedule, but then also pivoting. Well, that's what I said. You write the roadmap in pencil, obviously, and understand that a roadmap has a, a shifting timeline. You know, I originally started talking about writing the book about five years before I actually wrote it because the first time I said it out loud was at a breakfast, and no one at the breakfast knew that I was pregnant with my first child. And, you know, for those of you who have children or those of you who have met a, a child in your life, you understand that there is an overwhelming amount of stuff that goes along with just a small person that you're trying to keep alive and growing <laughs> also in your body, which is um, an interesting, I'll, that'll be my third Google talk. Um, but I do like I've like planned your entire schedule. Um, but I do feel like, you know, the really interesting thing about the roadmap and sort of the timeline is that, you know, I wrote this book when I had had three children in four and a half years. I could never have written it in the middle of having the children. It was just so intense. But then, you know, the baby was, I, I started writing it when she was still, she was not even one when I started writing the book. And it felt right. And I was ready to do it at that point. And it actually felt pretty easy to write because I felt like I was in a place and in a headspace where I could do it. So my point is that you set up your roadmap and you know what you're headed towards, but understand that sometimes patience is a good thing too. Like things will happen when they're supposed to happen and you can get it to that point, but the point is that you know where you're headed and you're not just sort of like I was for the first basically 10 years of my career where I was letting other people define what I was doing with no understanding that I was working in a career. I was like, oh, I go to work every day, and then I get a check, and then I spend that check, because you know, I was, had no idea what I was doing. And I feel like that is, that is what I wish someone had told me earlier on in my career. Like, think about what you want, and also get the people around you involved in your career. Because whatever you're doing, if you're going to your desk every day and you're seething because something isn't happening for you, chances are that the person above you probably doesn't know it. And I think that's one thing, I've, I've managed nine teams in my career. And I say to them, I'm like, don't come in here when you're angry and ready to leave. Come in here a year before you want a promotion. Come in here a year before our salary negotiations start so I can help you get there. And by the way, if you're not ready for it, I will tell you that too, because that's part of it as well. You need an honest roadmap that you're working on with someone who's aware of what your roadmap looks like. Amazing advice. Um, so we have a couple of questions from, from Googlers outside of New York. We'll go there and then open up the floor for questions. Um, we have one from Jamie, a Googler in California, who um, has a, an art question for you I, and a technology question <laughs> combined. Um, as some of the world's most treasured pieces of art get sold to wealthy individuals for their personal collections, how is Christie's using technology and partnerships to democratize some of these masterpieces? So, well, Jamie, Jamie, as the head mm -hmm. of partnerships globally for Christie's, I will give you my direct line, and we can talk <laughs> about Google and how this can be helped. Um, Christie's is doing, you know, we are as a company really trying to ensure that every single person understands that Christie's is the world's greatest museum. We have collections right now, we have 20th century art on view. We have everything from Jeff Koons to Basquiat. These are coming from private collections and most likely going back into private collections. So you may never see them again in your life. We are open to the public from 10 to five, Monday through Friday. So if you wanna see anything at any of our locations in the world, people always think Christie's, oh God, they only sell the Da Vinci's. It's true, we sell masterpieces, but we also sell beautiful things at completely reasonable prices, the same things that you would find on One King's Lane. So I encourage you to shop at Christie's in the way that you would shop in any, any other store, because frankly, the things that we have at Christie's are beautiful, they have provenance, and they come from great collections, and they can be in your home for less than you're buying something on One King's Lane or West Elm. And if you want to use Christie's as a resource, as you would use a museum, come in. 
we're free. We want you to come in. And so in order to do that, just that sort of foot traffic, but then even in terms of technology and partnerships, the company is also working on creating partnerships with dynamic individuals. Like we're doing um, an artificial intelligence and art and tech summit June 25th. You're all welcome to come. It is all on AI. And we've um, partnered with Hyundai, and we're, we have actually people from Google coming, as well as another a number of other um, great companies that are out there that are really doing a lot in the AI space. So we are, as a company, trying to evolve. We're trying to get our art out there. It's all available online, and always come in to see it if you can. Yeah, amazing roadmap at Christie's. Um, another Dory question from Joe in our Sydney office. Um, she asks about advice for women from Asian cultures um, where proactiveness might not come naturally, I guess, um, is what she's saying, and that sometimes um, one has to push themselves to be overly extroverted. Do you advise um, faking until you make it um, as a strategy then if it's not your authentic self? I mean, I feel like women in general, I don't think this is just in the Asian culture, mm -hmm. we're often made to feel like if we're too assertive or too proactive, then people think that we're pushy or aggressive. I, if, if you're not a naturally aggressive person, don't fake an aggressive personality because I think that's gonna be, make you feel uncomfortable. And what we were talking about earlier about selling is yourself, mm -hmm. it's really about bringing to the table what you are and who you are. So if you're somebody who's not hard charging, but then you're trying to fake it, the person across the table from you is gonna feel that. I get a lot of questions about introverts. Um, you know, what do I do? How do I sell if I'm an introvert? And I always say, you know, if you're an introvert, you're actually in a better position because silence is as effective a selling tool as just talking. And I use it on stage all the time when people are just talking nonstop. Sometimes if I'm in the middle of a lot and I'm talking and they're talking and no one's listening, I just stop. And then I wait and I'm like, oh, you guys can be quiet. This is incredible. I had no idea. I've been up here for 20 minutes and I haven't heard one break in that silence. So use that as your, as your force in the way that somebody like me would use words as my force, as you guys have seen for half an hour now. <laughs> Speaking of words, let's open it up to the audience. Um, again, we have mics on both sides of the room. Um, would love to take uh, questions for Lydia. Oh. You're asking a question. Thank I, you. I don't just not. <laughs> I you, uh, thank you so much for your time. I thought you were leaving. <laughs> I'm very just, enjoyable really talk. Uh, I'm interested in help seeing your viewpoint on the difference between like being your own authentic self, mm -hmm. you know, selling as yourself, as opposed to listening. Right, mm -hmm. selling as yourself. You have a viewpoint. It is, yeah, I assume, like it's it's known like I am me. But yeah. the listening piece seems about adaptation yes. and fitting a message to the audience in a way that will be received best. Right. So how do you stay? true to yourself, but also be hyper adaptable yeah. and fit that message? That's a great question. So listening, as I, as, as I was saying earlier, the important thing about listening is using that time to craft your message. So even though you're listening, what you're coming back with should be in your words. It shouldn't be a canned elevator pitch that you're just sort of spouting out. And it shouldn't be something that necessarily matches what the other person is going to say. But you need to understand where they're coming from so that you understand how to put things into the words that will make sense to them. Because you remember how I was talking about with the proposal, having something that just didn't match at all? It's the same with even the way that you're approaching someone when you go in there. If you go in and they're you know, talking about something that you have absolutely no interest in, you can say that and you can be authentic about that and you can come back with what you have to sell. But at the same time, you want to understand where they're coming from so you're not just blowing through the entire conversation. Nice. Not thumbs a yes up. and a thumbs up. <laughs> yeah. Thank nice. you. Um, how about Very this side of the room? Hi. Hi. Uh, very interesting talk. And, uh, you know, I like uh, all the you know, jokes and everything. It's kind of splashy and it's like keep coming. And <laughs> it's like I, I, I enjoy it. But uh, the only thing is like, so I don't, I, don't, I don't think I can think as fast as you do and also <laughs> speak as fast Take as practice. you do. <laughs> so like... Um, when you like negotiate or communicate with someone else, like, do you have any suggestion for uh, people like me? Like, if uh, I cannot like speak, my in the future mm -hmm. uh, speak faster or think faster, but then, but then um, uh, it feels like a relatively slow pace. Mm -hmm. How do you still like uh, keep the convers uh, conversation going and get what you want and you know, yeah. it's like that. I know it is. 
You know, and I, and I will also say too, remember that I have been an auctioneer for 16 years. So this is not how it started out. Like, as I said, it started out in a much different way. So I think, as you were saying, over time, you're adapting yourself and you're adapting your ability to, to really get comfortable with your selling style. And when I train auctioneers, a lot of them are not humorous. It's not, they don't feel comfortable getting up and telling a million jokes, but they are very empathetic or they're very sincere. And you, I can tell already, are very sincere. You have a great smile, you have a great presence. So I would say sort of take your time in the conversation. You don't, if you have a joke that feels comfortable, throw it in there. You do not have to be a comedian. That is not the way that selling works unless it feels comfortable to you. But ask questions, think about what they're saying and come back to them with the sort of thoughtful approach that you're using even right now. Because people, people want to hear from you in the same way that they would want to hear from me. And it doesn't take 50 jokes to get there. It just takes a sort of slow and steady pace and then giving them the opportunity to talk as well and not just talking at them. Cool, thanks. By the way, the spot I really put a pressure. Uh, oh, yeah. I feel like <laughs> Good, <laughs> it's like a charity auction tryout. Anyway. I'm like, who's next? No. Um, Over here? The pressure's on. Yeah, uh, the pressure's on. Thanks for joining us, Lydia. Yeah, My question is around your first topic where you kind of remove the number off of the lots. Uh -huh. um, it goes against a tactic that I use, which is kind of like negotiations 101 mm -hmm. anchoring. So if you get the first number out there, the conversation will stay around that. Yeah. How do you kind of balance those two um, to ultimately get where you need to go without providing a number. Yeah, I know. It's so funny because I've had a lot of coaches say that to me. Um, you know, I think you have to adapt your own approach. This has been my approach and it works for me and that's why I stick with it. So, you know, if you feel like anchoring is going to make you comfortable or frankly, there are going to be sometimes where you can't fudge a number. Like someone does have to have a certain amount of money to play within that. But I also think that it really, especially when it comes to personal negotiation, the best thing that you can do is just keep your mouth shut and hear what they have to say first. So if you are working in an industry where you have an industry standard for a certain amount of money and you have to get it, then that may be what it is. But I just feel like in general negotiations, especially in salary negotiations, hearing what someone has to say first and then walking away is always a good way to do it too. Thanks. Yeah. Question over here. Hi, I just wanted to start and say I'm also not in my 20s. So I'm, not alone. Um, I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm, I'm in <laughs> no. my 20s. But I actually wanted to go um, back to sort of maybe your 20s. I'm just yeah. curious um, your path to Christie's. Yeah. Um, so I actually started my career at Sotheby's. Oh, Sorry. that's cool. um, And um, I've been at Google for now 16 years. Uh -huh. So talk about diversity of thought. I would say there's a ton of art. I know one other art history major. There's a ton here. So I'm just curious sort of your path and, and how you, what brought you to Christie's and why are you still there? So I essentially, when I was in college, I did a, my mother is British, which explains a lot about me. You guys don't know me that well. Unless you want to hang out later, I'll tell you. But she's British. And when I was young, she grew up in Oxford. And so it was always a place that I loved. I had three aunts who lived nearby in Oxford. And so we would visit them a lot. When I was in college, I had the college that I went to had a, a, um, an exchange program with Oxford. And so I went over there my junior year. And it was the first time I really had appreciated art. I mean, my parents took took us to museums when we were little, but it just always seemed like a struggle. Like we didn't really want to be there. It was tiring. We wanted to leave. And that was the first time I studied with a professor. And we started at Oxford and then we traveled around Western Europe with a professor and looked at art and took notes while we were there. So it was just this incredible opportunity to really dive deep. And I fell in love with it. And at the same time, I still don't know which magazine this was. I read a, an article about women who worked in the auction world. And it just seemed very glamorous, which was really the only thing I cared about when I was 19 or 20. I feel like you guys probably had better aspirations. I was like, this looks like the job for me, this international travel, the outfits, like meeting all these people. I gotta work at this place. I mean, my parents were not art collectors. I had never been to an auction house in my life. I never even heard of an auction house except for this article. But it kind of got into my brain. And so I say one of the one of the most effective ways to network or get anything done in life is to tell every single person you meet, no matter who they are, your life dreams, anything you want to achieve. I mean, you have no idea how many random people in this world know about the book that I've written. The most powerful woman in the room is you. It's hot pink. It's in the back by it. It's literally like cab drivers, people I sit next to in the airplane, like a random woman washing her hand at the sink. They know about the book because I bring it up every time I see them. Same thing with that internship. I mean, the same thing with Christie's. Every single person is like, well, they're like, what are you going to do after college? I'm going to work in the auction world. Oh, do you have a job on it? Mm, no. Are you, how are you, I'm going to work for this place called Christie's Auction House. It's located in New York City. Like, just my dad was at a cocktail party one night for Christmas. 
in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, not a huge art collecting hub, and dragged a girl over and was like, this woman is in, she just started working at Christie's Auction House. Like, what are the odds? This was not, this was not supposed to be. And I just, I was like, great, talked to her for half an hour. She was, by the way, everything the article said she was. She was chicer than anyone there. I was like, this woman, this is what I want to be. Um, again, very small scale at this point. And uh, she handed me the number for the internship coordinator, who I then, you can read this in the first chapter or second chapter of my book, I stalked her, like, without, because she didn't have caller ID. So I just called her every day. And finally, she, the internship was program was full. And I talked my way in. And that was the beginning of my first internship at Christie's. I did another one right after college. And then I've been there ever since. Cool. Yeah. It's a long answer. But thank you for your question. <laughs> Such good detail. Hi. Hi. I'm Miriam. Um, I am curious about what your thoughts are on the future of auctions, in the mm -hmm. sense that with the, how technology is evolving and the reach of technology and what is being sold and the information about that object, um, if you think that there will, if you know, auctions will eventually just go all online, or do you think that there? And is that do you think something that is, you know, something you would be sorry to see, or is there a value of like having the in-person attendance? I, I, um, when I was little, my 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 mom would take me to auctions at Christie's just to like watch, mm -hmm. and it was so interesting to watch back then. But it was like you know, people on the phones on the side, mm -hmm. and then a room full of people. I don't know how packed the rooms are today, but I would imagine that technology is. Is, is disrupting it to a certain degree. I yeah. was just curious, you know, what you think about how the future of auctions. So we, as a company, I think this is an ongoing dialogue because, you know, in the past, I think, eight years, we've started doing auctions where you're bidding at the same time, real time, with someone from anywhere in the world. So bidding with Sydney, and then you're taking a bid from the phone bank, and you're taking a bid in the room. So they can bid literally as the auctioneer is going. You're sort of taking the bids as if they're in the room. Um, in addition to that, we have a lot of sales that go online now exclusively because obviously for us it's a lot less expensive than installing it. Because if you imagine, Christie's is like a museum, as I said. We install and deinstall every four days. So if you were to come to Christie's today, you would see post-war and contemporary art. If you come next week, you will see Latin American art. And I'm talking like 20,000 square feet of art. So we're basically doing what a museum does once a year every four days, overnight setups, the whole nine yards. Um, it's, it's extremely expensive and it's, it's also extremely cumbersome. So I think for us, it's great to be able to put some of the things that are lower lots in value um, online. But I think the one thing, and, and our CEO said this years ago when Sotheby's had gambled and gone with eBay, um, this is probably 15 or 16 years ago, he was like, I think there will always be a need at the highest level when people are transacting for the Picasso, excuse me, Picasso or Monet or Manet or something like that, to come in and actually see it with a specialist and to stand next to somebody who can say to them, this is what we say it is, this is why it is what it is, and this is why I think that you should purchase it for your collection or your, one, your first and biggest purchase ever or whatever it may be. So I think ultimately we will be in a place where most of most of the lower lots will be online, jewelry, things like that. But at the highest level, I think we will always have, you know, that sort of atmosphere pe that people love about the art world. It has its own its own culture. Of course. Hi. Hi. Um, I really loved what you shared about writing down your roadmap and also writing it in pencil as somebody who <laughs> also writes in pencil. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to see if you would be willing to share some things that you had on your roadmap that you'd erased mm -hmm. and how you made that decision and then also any other items on your roadmap for future. So in my roadmap, before I started Strategic Partnerships for Christie's, which happened when I was 10 years into my career, I wanted to be the global head of events for Christie's. That was really my aim. I don't know why I always wanted a global takeover, but that for some reason was always something that I was interested in, the global takeover. So I had really pitched this idea of global head of events many times, and that was on my roadmap. And there just was no appetite for it internally. They were like, we don't need a global head of events. We need them regionally. We don't need one person who can sort of unify this, this strategy for us. Um, that was on my roadmap, and that definitely came off. I mean, at one point, you know, I'd explored other career paths, like maybe I leave Christie's, maybe I do something. So those were sort of little branches. They didn't really actually ever end up being anything that was interesting, but those were on there. I have a lot more on my roadmap, by the way. I'm planning to live until I'm 120, <laughs> so I'm just a third of the way there, in case you guys were wondering. Um, but I feel like, you know, it's really a roadmap for me right now is really what's in front of me more than anything. Other than, I don't even really remember what I didn't accomplish as much as what I have to accomplish. Thanks. Sure. 
Cool. And over here. Yes. Hi. I like that you brought your computer with you, just in case. <laughs> yes. uh, you mentioned this book is for everyone. Uh -huh. uh, I work as a programmer. Uh -huh. Would you mind giving me some reason why should I read the book? Oh, I mean, come on. I'm wearing the same color as the color of the, co the book cover. <laughs> I'm trying hard enough for you. I mean, I think, I will tell you honestly, the book is not written as bullet points and tips. It's written as a story. And I hope that you will see a part of yourself in the story. It's a woman who started in New York when she was 20 and didn't really know exactly where she was headed or what she was going to do and really stumbled my way through a lot of major rejections and failures along the way, which I feel like I'm very frank about. I talk about finding out that I'm underpaid and going into my boss's office and really pushing to get what I felt I deserved. I talked about, you know, hearing from a colleague, somebody, I overheard somebody say in a meeting, um, actually, I didn't overhear it. I was sitting in the meeting, so I should say that again. Um, you know, Lydia is such a self-promoter. She was saying that because she'd heard somebody else at Sotheby's say that about me, and I wanted to die. And I talk about sort of getting to the realization now that self-promotion and being good at promoting yourself is actually a huge part of being successful in life. And believing in yourself and your message and what you can do is also a huge piece of being successful. So the book is a story, but it, more than anything, I hope it'll inspire you, no matter if you're a man or a woman. Um, I'll tell one quick story. I had a friend who has a daughter who uh, plays the guitar. She's in third grade. And they listen to the book on Audible. I read the book on Audible. And she was playing in a concert last week. And she said that her daughter, as they were falling asleep, said to her, Mom, can we listen to Miss Lydia's book again tomorrow? I want to hear that part on public speaking just one more time. And she said, hand to God, those words came out of her mouth. She's like, I mean, she's a child, you know? But I think we all need to feel a little inspiration and motivation, especially, especially as women or men who are in a similar place where they just don't feel like they're being heard or they have confidence in their voice. So. You're wearing a pink sweater too, which I feel is like we're sisters, so you should buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> I, I That's think, what I think. I, I like that example you gave with um, selling the sports memorabilia as opposed to the art, but mm -hmm. I'm wondering, have there been any impossible situations where the other person had absolutely no interest, and um, what takeaways are you going after in that kind of impossible situation? Yeah. Um, yes, I have those conversations almost daily. But I think, honestly, going back to what I talk about with rejection and failure, I often say to them, you know, is there anything at the end of it, I'll be like, you know, I know that this didn't work out. Is there anything that I'm not thinking of that maybe could be a place where we could intersect, if there's something that we could work on together that I'm not seeing, but perhaps you see? Um, and then I try to give them a couple more, a couple of additional examples about other things that we can do. But sometimes a no is a no. You know, and, and that you have to also be respectful of that. But I also believe in staying in touch. Because I work in partnerships, some things that have, you know, some things happen immediately, some things it's like, you know, it all fits, it all works. And other partnerships have come back a year later. As I said, you know, new CEO, new chief marketing officer, new conversation, or I see an ad where all of a sudden I'm like, this could work. This could now work in a way that it didn't five years ago. So even if no means no, it could mean no for now. Just keep the, keep the lines of communication open and keep checking back. OK, maybe the last question. And, and Lydia, you'll be in the back for just a yeah. couple of minutes after, um, after this last question. You can talk all day, ladies. <laughs> Uh, I'm wondering if you ever had a mentor or mentors and how you found them and how did you keep in touch and maintain the relationship? So this was a question that was asked at the very first, um, very first breakfast that I did. And the answer is I did not actually have any mentors um, in my career. My peers have been my mentors my whole life. I did a panel last night with my best friend who I always joke and say that she's the Gail to my Oprah and I'm the Gail to her Oprah. Like we both think we're Oprah, but we're so psyched that Gail is doing so well in her career. Um, <laughs> we're like, you're doing so well, Gail. She's like, easy, Gail. Um, um, Gail King's like, thanks. But, um, but I, I definitely think that my peers for me have been those people. Like they are the people I call at 11 o'clock at night when a deal busts and I'm dying inside or, you know, I was leaving for my book tour. I have three kids. My husband was pushing my son on a swing and he fell off and broke his collarbone the night before I left on like a five day home for 12 hours, five day book tour. Not a good feeling. So all of these sort of like people in my life and, and all of these people are peers for life, but also for work. And they're the ones I go back to. 
But I just say, like, surround yourself with yes people who you look around and you're like, you're killing it. You need to be my squad. Like, you're killing. You're all killing it. Let's get this together and, and move this forward. My last chapter is about a networking breakfast that I talk about putting these just incredible people together with another woman. We didn't know five of, five of the people who came on either side of the table. And it's been one of the most fulfilling things in my life. I've met so many incredible people. And now the, we cap it at 25 now, because there's so many people who just want to come and meet and be part of it. So no mentors, but I'm up for mentoring. So I give out my email to anyone. Beware. I will email you back. <laughs> and make sure you're doing what I told you that you needed to do, or vice versa. Thank you. Um, Lydia, thank you so much for spending this time with us. Thank you guys for being here.